you always have to actually do diligence the person who's spearheading the like you know the operation and you know making sure that this person is going to be my um, sustainable partner so that being said like you can tell that i've been burned by certain companies who came across like with a lot of great check marks, um, but ultimately it wasn't the right person that to do business with. Welcome, this is Phil Michaels, Forbes 30 Under 30 Entrepreneur and Performance Coach. Forbes names the top 30 entrepreneurs, leaders, and stars in the world. And each week we bring you one of them to help you level up in your life and business. From celebrities like LeBron James to Kylie Jenner and Cardi B, you're sure to learn from the list. Thanks for spending time with me today. Now it's time to level up. Level up. Level up. Welcome to the Phil with Forbes 30 podcast. Today we have a very special guest. She made the Forbes 2020 list in the USA for the art and style category. She's the co-founder of two entities, Sunday School and Sunday Flower. It's not what you think. They sell high-end clothes and high-dose cannabis. Sunday School is their boutique fashion smokewear brand based in New York. Smokewear, as in high fashion apparel and accessories to wear when you're smoking weed. Sunday Flower is their cannabis brand that sells cannabis flowers without harmful chemicals. Her and her best friend since elementary school started out in South Korea, then both immigrated to the U.S., where they discovered marijuana at boarding school, creating their longtime love affair with cannabis into a career with a collection of clothing, which has been featured at New York Fashion Week, Barney's, and even recognition from celebrities like John Legend and Lil Nas X. Their cannabis flower sells at some of the biggest California dispensaries, including Ease and Apticarium, and sells the slowest burning, but slimmest joint. Please welcome my very special guest, Nia Park. Yay. Thank you so much for the introduction, Phil. I'm so excited to be on the platform and just chatting with you about anything that we're both particularly interested in. Very excited to have you here. It's my honor. Welcome to the show. Uh, before we get started and dive into things, where were you when you found out you made the Forbes list? Um, I was actually at a cafe and it was raining in New York. Um, you know, those like blizzard type of rain. Um, and it was really cool with a friend of mine having actually breakfast because I actually do really love meeting people for breakfast right before work. And I um, read the news or my I think my co-founder day actually sent the newsletter to me because I'm the type of a person who gets way too nervous. So I try to actually like wipe it out from my brain. And when I heard the news, I was with my friends um, at like 8 a.m. So that was really, really exciting. Um, I remember calling my parents finally, telling them um, like how excited this was. They must have been very proud of you because <laughs> it was just legalized in, in South Korea, right? They did legalize the medical, but um, it's so still demonized as well mm. as, you know, the government regulation on any sort of cannabis possession and they even wrote it, like I've read this pretty intensely because you know I was just interested on the legality side of cannabis in Korea and essentially even the thought of consuming or doing a business in Korea could potentially um, throw you into jail so mm. they're really really harsh um, where they draw the line um, for especially weed and, but I do think it's a small victory that we are trying to legalize CBD as well as hemp. So um, yeah, yeah, definitely exciting moment. One mm -hmm. step closer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that, it's great that you're also, you're based in New York, but you're also uh, pretty well known in the California area as well. That's where you sell most of your cannabis, correct? That's right. 100% of our cannabis um, is being sold in California. Um, we are special because as a fashion brand, we did start out here in New York and it was really grassroots. Like we were just making things for our friends, essentially who wanted to get high and put their joints on their cap. So one of our signature like caps have basically a joint pocket on the side and like all our t-shirts and hoodies come with those like hidden, very like stealthy joint pockets. Um, so that's why we definitely feel very grounded in New York. 
But um, obviously the second phase where, which made Sunday School what it is right now, started 100% in California. So we feel also very local in California and honestly really, really blessed to have connected with amazing partners, especially in the cannabis side. Um, I don't think we could have started with so much success um, if it weren't the mentors in California, like just guiding us every step of the way. I love that you created into a lifestyle brand too, where you incorporate the weed smoking culture into the clothing. So it's not an afterthought. It's like, well, well, I could just hold it right here on my, on my sleeve, or I could have a pocket on my hat for the joint, for example. And I love that you launched on 420. How perfect is that? Exactly. I mean, I think the there's we I hear the word lifestyle so often, but at the end of the day, we just wanted to create a brand or just like, you know, something that paralleled the lifestyle of a lot of our friends and us, which is that we smoke weed, but we're also excellent students, excellent chefs excellent, I don't know, employees. So that being said, we call them class up honor rollers. We like being punny with <laughs> weed jokes. Like if we weren't being punny with weed jokes, what, like, why are we doing this? So <laughs> um, yeah, we call them honor rollers or rather, you know, like, um, like responsible smokers. So um, these functional stoners really do make up of a lot of our community as well as, you know, a lot of social initiatives that we also try to take on. It changes the dogmatic narrative that you are yeah. just this lazy pot smoking, you know, couch yeah. surfing individual. No, you can actually be very successful and smart and also enjoy cannabis. And yeah. it seems like that's becoming more and more popular. So congrats on disrupting the narrative. Um, take us back to the very beginning, Mia, where you're from, where you grew up and the path that ultimately led you to where you are now, making it to the Forbes list. Absolutely. I mean, I grew up in Seoul, Korea until in, for the entirety of my life until middle school. And, you know, I came here to America to a boarding school for the hopes of higher education. I, I must say my parents sent me, I didn't really have too much of a choice, but they didn't know what type of higher education I was be, I'd be getting at this point. Um, but let that alone. Um, for Another me, fun like, there for the audience. <laughs> yeah. <can> that. <laughs> and I love that you require a 4.2 GPA or higher. Exactly. Absolutely. That was what I was getting at my boarding school. Um, so I was definitely a very a model student until obviously um, for one thing, one Thanksgiving, a friend of mine um, invited me and another like four other international students to her house and essentially like I smoked my first joint at a friend's house during Thanksgiving during like during my junior year and I was just giggly and just having so much fun um, and was so mesmerized by the whole communal aspect of smoking as well. Um, It kind of creates your clan, like who I smoke with. And that was my first experience. So it was pretty like, it was very like smooth and just like, you know, like very um, pleasant. Um, So we come back from Thanksgiving, um, snuck a small, small joint back to our really strict dorm room and essentially in like maybe within like a week or two where we pulled it out and said hey maybe we should smoke this joint at a dorm um little did we know we were such noobs um we have heard our like other you know students in the dorm room like basically smoking but obviously they're smoking with like huge vaporizers doing their like the expert stuff to like let the like smoke and the smell out but then we were just like five girls like who didn't know anything so we actually got caught smoking weed like literally five seconds after we lit it and we basically got kicked out and this was my junior year which um per my korean parents is the most essential like it's the most critical year of your entire life um to get into good college and getting kicked out from that like very prestigious but also like one strike policy dorm like boarding school was it's just it was a little bit traumatic and um but one funny story that came out of it was that all five of us were just like uh, so the dorm parents knocked on our door door and we're smoking and like we had a half burned roach in in our hands so we're like what do we do with the roach 
And I've watched way too many CSI at that point. So I was like, I'm going to get rid of the evidence. So I actually ended up swallowing the joint. Um, so the dorm parent never found the joint. However, like it took some time, honestly, for me to reacquaint myself with the whole world of cannabis, because after that experience, um, whether I've known it or not, I think I was a little bit traumatized, um, especially not that, you know, like I definitely got back on track, you know, in terms of the education itself. But I think with a lot of people who might um, echo this, like if you've had any sort of bad trip or bad experience, getting too high or getting too thirsty, like for with smoking cannabis, like you may try to stay away from it. And that's what we try to, you know, in terms of the product R&D portion, we have these mini, mini joints that are basically meticulously rolled to get you that perfect pleasant high without making you feel paranoid um and it did come a long way for us to make those joints um as well as this new special product that we will be launching early next year within the cannabis space um all of that consideration like of my experience as well as my co-founders experience melt into like the narratives as well as the product themselves. And I think what speaks to a lot of our customers is just that, oh, this is a product that I exactly needed to support, you know, a certain lifestyle or just fits right into my daily rhythm. So we're always so happy on both clothing side and also the cannabis side, whenever we hear the feedback that, hey, this is a product we've, I've been looking for in the market. Um, I think that's a way for us to really bring innovation um, as like a little tiny fabric of this huge two industries. I love that you take a scientific educated approach to breaking down cannabis and how you're going to best serve your consumers, because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that maybe have wanted to try it and had their a bad first experience. And so they shy away from it now because maybe they did have a bad, you know, high or they got too high and they got paranoid and like, oh, and this isn't for me. But once you study it scientifically enough and you've worked with it, experimented with it enough, you now know what is the proper dosage? What is the type of flower that maybe works best for your biochemistry than somebody else? Which is the reason I, I'm so glad Johns Hopkins is now the first academic institution studying psychedelics on a large oh academic scientific scale. It's so important because now we're going to know the things that we didn't know before. It's not going to be like some guy on the couch trying to figure this out. It's going to be taking a very methodical approach to saying, hey, this is the experience you want. Here's the micrograms of the dosage that you should take. And this is the type of drug that maybe you should consume to give you that experience rather than playing a guessing game, which I know my first experience with marijuana was the same. It was a guessing game. You don't really know what you don't know. And you have like your buddy or your older brother telling you what's right or <laughs> wrong. And they're just saying it with conviction as if they know and they have no idea. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the whole psychedelic area. I mean, honestly, this podcast today is so interesting because we're just talking about drugs at the end of the day. Um, but the psychedelic area is so interesting. Absolutely. And I think um, for both cannabis and psychedelics, one, it's natural, like it's nothing synthetic. And two, um, and on top of all those medical and, you know, health benefits, I think there's definitely benefit mentally and psychologically that it, it um, cause I've, I've also seen a lot of, or read a lot of studies about psychedelics, particularly that it enables somebody with deep depression to break away from it, um, which that they were ne never able to do with synthetic drugs or like, you know, only psychotherapy. So it's, it's really interesting. And I think for weed as well, although it's a little bit, um, more research, but obviously there's much more like a longer way to go. Um, I do really believe in the power of um, it enabling our creativity. And that's really how um, they and I started um, Sunday School because we're both um, like basically, we were working at big corporations. We were consultants um, and had no background of design. So we would smoke weed on the weekend just to sketch things out. Um, and that's really where we were able to draw this interesting intersection between Korean heritage as well as cannabis. Um, 
I'm sure you see, but our clothing always incorporates some sort of Korean or Asian inspiration behind. And I think it's very critical for a brand to continue to be authentic um, by drawing, you know, our personal experience and just melting it down authentically. Um, and it really does speak to our, you know, audience as well as our, you know, like fans. Yeah, you're incorporating a little piece of your own authenticity and and um, your your family. So your family. Speaking of your family, you went from you know getting kicked out of boarding school, which I'm sure they weren't too happy about. So you turned your pain though into a gift <laughs> that you're now serving others with. So when you started to become successful, how did your family feel about that? Because I'm sure that blew their minds. <laughs> so the funny story, the reason why Forbes 30 under 30 was special for me was because that was the only way I could actually um, come out of my, like, I've never told them about Sunday school for two years. Um, and they thought I was still working at the consulting agency. So I actually presented them the Forbes 30 under 30 article first and like, hey, like, this is what I've been doing. <laughs> um, so for them, you know, they still live in Korea. Um, it's hard to break from the, you know, such rampant uh, media, like attacks on cannabis, as well as obviously just like the whole society's like mold about like cannabis and deeming it to be the devil's lettuce. Um, however, they are, I mean, parents are going to be always parents. So they're really excited and they're just like, big fans of Sunday school at this point. Um, they can't really try out our California products, but they really love the fashion portion and try to rep us as much as they could um, without <laughs> flagging the government, essentially. Well, if, if you yeah. can uh, please your Korean parents, I'm sure you're going to be able to please and, and persuade anybody else <laughs> that this <laughs> is a really good, good thing. Point. Yeah. <laughs> Mia, what do you think was the single most important personal attribute that you got to where you are today? The thing that's been um, emphasizing a lot lately to me is really simple, um, knowing what you like. And it's a tough sentence. If I were to ask somebody, um, you know, it, it can be as simple as, what, which restaurant do you wanna go tonight? Um, and a lot of times I think we are lost in either analysis paralysis, which we call to be, oh, I'm thinking way too like, too complicated for certain choices and not being able to make a decision or um, actually not knowing what you want to do or actually not knowing what you like. And I think being true and just like giving a lot of thoughts about what do I like? Cause that's also like part of a lot of the design process um, and which is where I'm drawing this experience from. Like at the end of the day, like there's a like million ways that we can interpret a theme um, to put it into the garment and come up with the design. But it's the only North Star or the only thing that guides you through that process is trusting yourself on what you like and what you don't like. Um, so also navigating through the motions in life, and obviously we're still really young in our career, is just listening to my own inner instinct. Hey, do I like this choice? Do I not like this? Like the whole word like is a little vague and I'm simplifying things, but it's essentially like whether I think this is a good decision or not in a very simple form. Um, so I think that uh, the force of knowing what you like um, is something that I continue to ask myself, hey, I need to you know, hone my skill almost to know what I like and what I don't like to continue to like, you know, chase that North Star, um, or it does get, you know, I don't want to be looking back, you know, after 10 years or even two years of doing something and realize, oh, I never liked my experience. Uh, I never like, liked this product that I created. So I think that co conviction almost um, is something that would propel a lot of people um, moving forward without feeling exhausted. Um, and feeling continuously motivated. I love that. And then flipping on the flip side, what do you think, knowing what you know now, what is the biggest lesson you learned during your journey that maybe you had wished you had learned from sooner? Every time when we make either even business relationship or personal relationship, 
um, do the business based on the person. Obviously, I think we're all smart enough that, you know, like, say a company comes up with a proposal to manufacture your goods and like we're all going to do due diligence on certain things about the company but at the end of the day it's really the person who runs it or a group of team who you know spearheads the project and what i've learned is that of course like you know we have this like a list of diligence that every time we try to start something new or go in about like um, like create a new set of joints um then we would always you know look into the companies itself but what i learned for a sustainable entrepreneurship or business is that you always have to actually do diligence with the person who's spearing spearheading the like you know the operation and you know making sure that this person is going to be my um, sustainable partner so that being said like you can tell that i've been burned by certain companies who came across like with a lot of great check marks um but ultimately it wasn't the right person that to do business with and i wish i had known this earlier because um i think i would and i'm we are now like putting a lot of emphasis on like meeting the right people um not just like you know the companies or the service that offers um and i think in that way we could actually minimize a lot of the mistakes that we had um made in the beginning of the journey of this entrepreneurship so like you're saying when you go to partner with a company make sure you know the who the people are what they stand for behind that company not just the brand exactly exactly and you are doing something similar where you try to uphold strong values can you tell us a little bit about uh, more about your values and what you do with your farmers and etc yeah absolutely um i mean as uh for who we are like we're a minority brand uh, we are immigrants um we are somewhat uh, you know like we're all part of those um so that being said on the fashion side we actually make everything in korea so that we could you know somehow contribute to the economy and also take advantage of amazing like korean like factories as well as like sewing expertise um so that's one part of the business on the other side of the cannabis business we partner with every single step of the way of you know sourcing and manufacturing we partner with um you know fully equity as well as minority uh, manufacturers distributors as well as like flower farms so that has been something actually very recent that we were able to implement the entire supply chain to be like that and we're really really proud of um, for instance our manufacturer SF Roots um, spearheaded by Morris Kelly is actually one of the very first Bay Area um, equity brand so equity brand in Northern California means that um, you know, it's a uh, for people who've been disenfranchised and unjustly, um, you know, marginalized because of cannabis, the city or the municipality grants those particular people much easier licensing deal or certain benefits if you want to start a cannabis company. So SF Roots is actually the first or definitely one of the first equity brand in San Francisco. And I mean, they were also really bank joints with hash. But that being said, they uh, partnering up with them honestly gives us a whole new angle because even just having conversation with Morris gives me many ideas like, you know, how this industry in cannabis, although it's new and, you know, there are a lot of innovative moments, um, could honestly improve in its diversity. Um, and for us, like, it's it's a different narrative of how we've been disenfranchised as Asian American versus like Black Americans, Latin Americans. Um, so just also hearing those different shades of, you know, you know, experiences within cannabis is so important for us. So we also don't lose the grasp of reality and just think that we are the minor, like, you know, marginalized population. And yeah, there is so much we could do within cannabis to increase diversity. We need to just legalize it across the, the country and, and, <laughs> and pretty much get everybody out. I'll be the first prison. in line to vote. <laughs> yeah. for sure. Hopefully soon. Um, thinking about your hustle and getting to where you are now, what's something scrappy you did in the beginning stages to start the company that maybe you couldn't have revealed in the very beginning when you were first starting out, but you're willing to share now? 
I mean, we're scrappy still, so, and we are not afraid to tell you that we're scrappy to get a better deal. And that's the truth, <laughs> to be honest. We're still a team of, you know, like less than 10 people full time. I mean, we do work with a lot of freelancers, but at the same time, I don't think it's about the volume or having a nice office, but it's about just creating something. I rather create, I rather spend more money on the cotton quality than, you know, having a nice, like, water cooler in the office. So, a few stories. I mean, I can tell you many, many stories how we've been always scrappy. But the very first time we um, started selling our, like, caps and, um, like, our signature joint pocket holder hoodies, um, one of the big breakthrough really came when we got a call from Barney's um, RIP, but that was uh, three, four years ago when we actually had just started as like a side, like, you know, side passion project. And actually this girl reached out to us and like, hey, like, I'm really, I really like your concept. Can you come like show your clothing to us? So we were, and it was now thinking back, it's, it's like, you know, like showing them and like having a clinic, um, but we had no idea back then. So essentially we like wrapped in our, like, you know, those like immigrants, immigrants, like big, like check-in luggage. So in those, we dumped every clothes, like didn't even separate per each collection or season, dumped every single thing that we made until then, like maybe like 20 pieces, literally took the subway in New York with that luggage, like took it to that fancy, like Fifth Avenue Barney's meeting, didn't even bring our own hangers. We didn't know that we had to bring our own hangers and the clothings were all wrinkled. Um, so we were like starting to hang up the clothes and the buyers would be asking, so like what season or like what's the theme of this um you know like your current drop and we had no idea we're just like oh we're just a korean smokeware brand and fortunately i think the honesty actually got us into barney so they were almost the first um you know like luxury stockists that we were able to onboard with but um that being said you know getting the call from like instagram dm taking the subway with the big luggage it's just like it, like it's a definitely memorable moment for us. And Scrappy just, hustle. We landed Barney's from an Instagram <laughs> DM. <laughs> definitely. That's awesome. What's your most popular product that you sell? Um, our honestly, our T-shirts with the side sleeve joint pocket has been obviously the most popular within the fashion side. Um, anything that also really has distinctive Korean. Uh, design. So we had launched as like a limited kind of pre-order only um, tantong pattern, which means it's like actually Korean temple um, pattern on in like on the ceiling of the temples. That means like infinity as well as well-being um, all over the fleece, and that really sold very well. So anything that has like that authenticity um, with a little bit of you know puns of weed um i think it sells really well in the fashion obviously on our cannabis side our mini joints that are like you said the slowest burning but the slimmest in the market self-claimed um you know they sell really well because it's it's something that day and i have spent so many time of uh, you know making it perfect and we're we're continuously always on the run to making it better and better so on that sense, our, you know, sativa variety, uh, we call it Eureka, um, tiny but mighty joints. So those sell really well across all our stockists in California. I love it. Thanks for sharing. And I know the audience is going to love to check those out. We're going to transition now into something I like to call the under 30 seconds round. Another, there's a pun for you. Uh, are you ready? I'm so ready. Okay, Mia, what is the book you've gifted more often than any other book and why? Oh God, it's called Knife War, Knife Ball. It's a very depressive but comical suicidal book. Um, and it actually gets you to think very optimistically about life. That was a really weird answer. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a satirically comical book that I like gifting to my friends to look optimistically about life thinking the ways that you can kill yourself, but yeah. What's one of the best investments and one of the worst investments you've ever made and why? Um, my best investment, I say my sister. I definitely wiped her, you know, like 
like clean cleaned and bathed her and now she's an amazing person to be and i know that i will have her lifelong support um the worst investment is uh probably a true uh a birds of paradise tree that i basically um couldn't water for three months and died pretty recently so never buy expensive trees that you can't really take care of i think there's a lot of people that could empathize with buying <laughs> plants that didn't end up working out <laughs> oh, man. what is the most impactful thing you do in your morning routine and the most impactful thing you do in your evening routine um, morning routine, actually, uh, we have this with day. Uh, we start with our like tea ceremony. So we drink green tea every morning, um, which really helps clarify your goals of the day as well as, you know, subduing the noise. Um, nightly routine, I must say, smoking joints. I don't do it every night, but um, on Friday nights, smoking that like indica joint is so amazing. Just, you know, wrapping up the whole week um, very smoothly. Do you have a particular place or ritual you have when it comes to your smoking habits? I love smoking at my house because I think you just have to be in a, you know, uh, you know, like in the, the right surroundings. So um, I love having people over and like, you know, smoking together. Um, and that's always been my go-to when it's like dinner party or whatnot. Like we start with a smoking ceremony and then we go into like eating food. <laughs> Love it. Pretend you won the Peter Thiel fellowship and you were going to get money to start a business instead of go to school. What's the very first thing you do to start your new business? Um, I would give calls to my mentors. Um, like I said, finding the right people is always the most important thing. Whether I need to start a team or finding a manufacturer or whatever it is, um, my mentors, I know for sure, would give me the right advice to start anything. Great one. And last question, what's something you never knew you needed? Uh, Google Calendar. Honestly, I've used it before, before the Sunday school, and it's inseparable part of my life. <laughs> um, so definitely, yes. I think a lot of people would agree with that as well. Uh, Mia, thank you so much for being here today. What's next for you? What's the next big goal, milestone, or bucket list item you want to achieve? Um, there are definitely several, but I think the one and foremost that we've been pushing for the last two months is the whole equity portion on the cannabis side. Um, I think having now transition into like a full supply chain of, you know, minority and equity partners. Um, now we really want to give it a voice um, by having more like more vocalizing a little bit better about like the fact that, you know, this is what we stand for on the cannabis side as well. Um, I think on the fashion side, we, we've been doing really well um, with that message. Um, overall, we believe that the cannabis industry could use a little bit more diversity in colors. So that would be one of the biggest goal for 2021. And you have a new holiday Korean Jesus collection that you wanted to share and an Asian flavored inspired cannabis gummies. You're right. Um, our holiday collection, which is coming up in two weeks, um, is again drawn by um, our Asian Korean experience. So we're actually reinterpreting all the biblical like stories about like Adam and Eve, um, Virgin Mary, and drawing into actually traditional Korean characters. So that's going to be really beautiful. Um, and in about two months, by Lunar New Year next year, we have couple of really exciting Asian flavored infused gummies that we're launching in California. So just to preview with you guys, we've never said anything to anybody, but it'll be yuzu white tea, lychee dragon fruit, um, you know, like uh, matcha coconut milk. So everything that we love like that and that we grew up. So I think it's gonna be an amazing Lunar New Year with us. Sneak preview audience, don't tell anyone. Shh. And Mia, where do listeners go to connect with you directly? Um, definitely hit us up at, at sunday.school um, via DM. That is definitely one of the most communi communicated channel for us. Um, we also have our website, www.sunday.school or sunday.flowers, um, if you want to learn more about our fashion as well as our cannabis side. 
There, you heard it first, ladies and gentlemen. You know where to go, connect with them. This is Amia Park with Sunday School and Sunday Flowers. By the way, Sunday is spelled S-U-N-D-A-E. And they provide you with high-end clothes and high-dose cannabis. We learned so much today. We learned focusing on knowing what you like to follow your North Star, how to turn your greatest pain into your greatest gift to serve others, and always look at the people behind the company you're going to potentially partner with before you do business with them. Mia, thank you so much for being here today. It was such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Phil. I hope this episode helped you as much as it helped me. Have an amazing day. Thanks for joining us today. I hope this episode helped you as much as it helped me. Who do you think would benefit from hearing it? You can make an impact on their life by sharing it now. Before you go, I encourage you to tell us your favorite part of the episode in the review section. Now it's time to level up. Level up.